Okay, so our study of vector spaces is over for now. Now the next topic is modules. Modules generalize the notion of vector spaces by allowing the scalars to come from rings instead of fields. So let's see the definition. It will make clear how this is a generalization of vector spaces. So we start the definition by considering a ring. Let R be a ring. And just like in vector spaces, there is an abelian group uh, whose elements we call vectors. Now we won't have vectors, we won't call them vectors, but we do have an abelian group. And let M be an abelian group under an operation plus we call M an R module or a module over R if for any ring element R and any element M from our set M there exists a unique element Rm in M such that the following axioms are true, the following conditions are true. R times A plus B is R A plus R B. We will say what this uh, A and B are to R times S A is R S times A and 3 R plus S times A is equal to R A plus S A. For all ring elements R and S and all elements A and B coming from M. So you can see that uh, this is almost exactly the definition of a vector space. The only difference now is that instead of a field, we have a ring. The abelian group structure, that part, is still there. And in fact, besides this addition, we also have a scalar multiplication type of operation that we have in vector spaces. You take a ring element, previously you took a field element, and then multiply by that element some element of your set. Previously you multiplied vectors by scalars, now you are multiplying elements in M by scalars. If, if we call these things scalars, that is ring elements. And looking at these conditions also, you see that these exact same things you had in the definition of vector spaces minus one condition. There is uh, something in that definition which has not appeared here and that is this thing. 1a equal to a. And you can uh, understand easily the reason. In a vector space, the scalars come from a field and we know that in a field there is always a unit element. 
and that unit element is 1 and in a vector space one of the conditions is that if you multiply any vector by that scalar 1 then you get that vector back which gives you that fourth condition. Here however in a general ring there is no guarantee that you will have a unit element and accordingly that condition is also missing. However, if there is a unit element in the ring and which behaves like that, then such modules have a name. If R has a unit element, one and one m is equal to m for all module elements instead of vectors we will just now call them module elements if this is the case then m will be called a unital arbitrary then M is called a unital armadillo. And then the author goes on to say that all our modules will be unital modules. However, the examples he provides after this definition uh, not all of them are unital modules, but eventually the result that that is the main purpose of this section that considers unital modules. Okay, so maybe that's why the says like that. Now, strictly speaking, this definition is actually the definition of a left R module. because we are multiplying module elements from the left by ring elements that's why there is a corresponding notion of right arm modules also however we will not use that distinction in this book because it will not be needed but there are uh, i mean there is that other notion also no modules form a fast part of algebra okay so this is just simply some things that we will need for a very specific result we are going towards that now let us see some examples oh okay i, I almost forgot this fact we have started our discussion by saying that modules generalize the notion of vector spaces uh, now let me just uh, ask you this suppose you have a unital r module okay say m is a unital r module that means along with these three conditions you now have the fourth one also let me write it here namely 1a is equal to a now can you say that this itself is a vector space because everything looks the same right but if you say yes then you would be wrong you see it's tempting to just look at these conditions and forget entirely the fact that in a vector space the underlying uh, system of scalars should form a field fine this ring r has a unit element but r may not itself be a field no? for example the ring of integers is a ring with unit element and accordingly you will have unital uh, r modules where r is the ring of integers but because r is not a field so the resulting module cannot be called a vector space in spite of being a unital r module so this is something that uh, 
we can easily get confused with okay and let us now see the examples but of course if you have a field here then a unital module will be a vector cell over that field you need a field this first example uh, it uh, looks like it sounds also very nice every abelian group is a module over the ring of integers and in fact it is unitary so this is a statement that we will prove in one of the exercises but at least let us see what the operations are that way we can uh, have an idea of what is going on rapidly we have said something about every abelian group and this statement does not even bother to mention the operations so that means the operations somehow must be extremely natural so natural that uh, there is no need to mention them even and that is the case you see so let, let us take a, an abelian group g and there is some binary operation which is commutative and we are saying that this g is a unital j, j for some reason uh, the author uh, denotes the set of integers or in fact the ring of integers by j or you can use the more familiar notation z or c so we need uh, first of all g to be an abelian group right and it, it is because we are considering an abelian group only so g is already an abelian group now we need that other operation also so let us take an integer in and some element g in g we need to define ng and this ng if you think of it for a moment can be most naturally defined to be the nth power of g and in fact considering the fact that g is an abelian group already there is a meaning of this notation ng which is nothing but that itself okay in additive notation this nth power of g is just simply written as ng this we have done in uh, group theory okay fine now is this you, you see this is a binary operation so although we sometimes very casually write things like this but you have to understand that behind all these things there is a rigorous uh, argument rigorous argument means rigorous setup so what you are doing here actually is you are defining well i should not have said it's a binary operation i mean uh, not in the usual sense of binary operation but it's a function and that function looks like this it's a function whose domain is this and whose codomain or range whatever you call it is this in order for this function to be well defined you have to have this you take any ordered pair any element from this cartesian product that gets mapped by this function to this element in g again so for a given such pair this first of all should belong to g 
that is the first condition and the second condition is that it should be unique then only this function will be well defined is that the case yes it is the case because you know that for a given integer n and a group element g the nth power of g is already a well defined group element and we did this in group theory towards the beginning of group theory itself so there is no problem with this binary operation but will it satisfy those conditions that we have in the definition of a module let us just see okay we, we will uh, write the solution when we solve the exercises formally but now itself let's just see how things are going to go so what are we going to do we take two ring elements let n and m be ring elements means integers and we also take two group elements g and h in g so first of all what is it we need to show we need to show that n times g plus h now you need to understand that this plus is actually the binary operation in g since g is abelian so we can denote it by plus but by definition this is nothing you will be a little confused if i if you if i continue to write this plus so instead let us just use multiplicative notation itself g plus h actually means g h where we are deciding not to use any uh, symbol for the binary operation. By definition, it's the nth power. Now, the fact that G is an abelian group allows you to write this. Okay. But this, if you translate it back uh, into these notations, is nothing but this. So that's how you have your first condition that is true. What about the second one? The second one is this. By definition, this is that power of g where the exponent is in m. But now you recall the laws of exponents that you have seen in group theory. So you can see that nm of course I can write as mn and then use one of the rules of exponents and write like that which again by this notation will be n times mg. So that's how you get the second one and what is the third one? The third one will uh, use the other rule of exponents. So we have in fact shown here itself how this is a J module or a Z module. Number three. So number three will be um, this N plus M G. this by that other rule of exponents is this which is nothing but ng plus mg so that means g is indeed a j module but is it unital we mentioned that it's unital for that you just have to consider this 1g by definition is the first power of g which by definition of integral powers is nothing but g so yes this is a unital z material any abelian group next example 2 example 2 is also a very nice example let R B a ring. It is kind of that one is also general, but it is kind of uh, somewhat more general. Let R be a ring and 
एम बी ए लेफ्ट आइडियल ऑफ आर डू यू रिमेंबर दैट इन द सेक्शन वेर वी स्टडीड आइडियल्स ऑफ रिंग्स दे आर नॉट इन द सेक्शन इट्स दट बट इन वन ऑफ द एक्सरसाइजेस वी डिफाइंड लेफ्ट एंड राइट आइडियल्स सेपरेटली um and we also mentioned there that we are not going to use that much this distinction of left and right in this book but uh, they are important notions so this is another instance where we are using it so you have a ring r and you have a left ideal of r what does that mean it means that m of course is an abelian group under the addition that we have in r so that is one condition and then the second one is that m engulfs multiplication of elements of m from the left by ring elements that is if you take any element of m and multiply it from the left side by any ring element then the product will lie inside m so this gives you the full idea of what you should do to make n an armadillo it's almost immediate now already m is an abelian group under the addition in r then m is then this is how we express that fact additive sub group of r and hence is abelian because r itself is an abelian group being a ring under its own addition and hence abelian okay now for any ring element and any ideal element m we define r m to be the product of r and m in r that means r m is just simply the product r m that you would calculate inside this ring r so not only are we using the addition of r in making m an abelian group but we are also using the multiplication that we have in r in order to define this operation note that since m is a left ideal so this rm belongs to m now verifying that the other conditions for a module are also true is very easy but still because we are uh, seeing the things in detail so let's just see this one also so let's just uh, instead of writing too much let's just take to ring elements and to a and b okay let's use a and b we have them the definition and two elements from the left ideal then what is r times a plus b because the operations are just simply the operations in r so here you can use the left distributive law that you have in r so by that law this is r a plus r b that's it that's what we wanted and we have got that next r times s a is equal to r s times a how is it true it is true because the multiplication in r is associative 
so it is just that and number three is this which is nothing but the right distributive class so that's why uh, m is an r material the author mentions that all the modules are unital here however i don't understand how this is unital because uh, r is any ring so r may not have a unit element and even if it has uh, well uh, if r has a unit element then in that case one times anything will be that thing itself and that is okay but r may be a ring which does not have a unit element what what do we have in that case in that case it's not unital So you can write a comment that this is not necessarily unital but this is only an example example uh, three is a special case of this since r is itself r means r is a ring you should understand that so that means it's kind of a continuation of this example r is itself a left ideal of r in a trivial way so r is itself a, an r material that too in a trivial way just like every group is a subgroup of itself something like that or uh, okay but not like that but i should have said this every field is a vector space over itself it is like that now there is another one Here also we will have a left ideal of some ring, but uh, we won't consider this module, but something else. Let R be a ring and lambda be a left ideal of R. Consider the set M whose elements are the left cosets of this left ideal lambda. These left cosets of course can be considered see the fact that lambda is a left ideal actually does not affect these cosets because you should remember that being a left ideal whether it is a left ideal or a right ideal by definition lambda first of all is an additive subgroup of r so as a subgroup it will have cosets so in that sense we have our normal cosets that's it lambda being a left ideal has nothing to do with this cosets okay on m we define this a plus lambda plus b plus lambda so we are defining an addition of elements in f you already know what this is this is a plus b plus lambda we already know that 
that m is an abelian group under this addition next for a plus lambda in m and r in r we define uh, the multiplication of a plus lambda by r from the left side this is also defined in a familiar manner like this it turns out that with this m is an r module not carefully that in the previous uh, not the previous example but the one before that had the left ideal itself as a module i mean as i said it was that itself here however instead of considering just lambda we are considering the set of cosets left cosets of lambda and you can understand that this construction of m is somewhat like uh, quotients like how we constructed quotient groups from groups and normal subgroups or quotient rings from rings and ideals and quotient spaces from vector spaces and subspaces here however again we have a ring uh, but now instead of necessarily an ideal we have a left ideal and instead of a quotient we have uh, i mean what can i say it's a module okay so what i said right now you should understand that it is like quotient construction but not quotient construction exactly if quotient modules are coming and it has a uh, name also in the name however it has been called a quotient module because it looks like one but actually if you really think about it uh, for quotient spaces we need groups and normal subgroups for uh, quotient rings we need rings and ideals so far however we have not defined sub modules okay that we will need for a proper quotient construction but it's structure looks like that of a quotient construction that's why m is usually called a difference module or a portion module r by lambda and is often denoted like this r minus lambda or in fact even r by lambda r slash lambda you may regard these things as some passing remarks okay no need to go too deeply into these things our aim is something else we do not want to develop modules as a general theory okay now we come to the definition of a sub module this section has many definitions but only one main result 
but for that result we need these definitions and additive subgroup a of an r module m is called a submodule of m if if it is closed under that uh, multiplication by ring elements if for every ring element and every element in a the product r a as calculated in the module n belongs to a itself and you can see that this is a very natural definition it is just like the definition of a sub ring of a ring it is somewhat like that or in fact yeah why why do i keep going to rings it is like the definition of a subspace of a vector space you imagine a vector space m here over some field then an additive subgroup of m will be called a subspace of m if it is closed under the formation of scalar multiplication in the sense that you take some vector from a and multiply it by a field element that product should always be inside a so it is mimicking that definition that's it okay vector space subspace module submodule and then of course uh, yeah this is where the actual quotient construction comes given an r module m and a sub module a so now if you have an r module m and a sub module a then you can of course construct a quotient module of r by a by proceeding naturally like how we are supposed to proceed and then of course having uh, this uh, quotient module this notion one can then go on to define homomorphisms from one module to another module and then prove the usual homomorphisms theorems linking quotients modules and all those things so these things can be done and they will be done in the exercises that come after this uh, section is over but the thing that we are interested in is a very specific result about finitely generated modules over euclidean rings so to get to that result we are going to need a few more definitions so let's now see this next definition let m p and r module although it's not necessary to every time mention the ring underlying ring but we keep mentioning it if you want you can just say let m be a module let m be an r module and m1 m2 Etcetera, M S, some finite number of sub modules. Sub modules of M. We say
that M is the direct sum of these submodules. So this again mimics the notion of the direct sum of the subspaces of a vector space, of some subspaces of a vector space. And accordingly the definition is also exactly the same direct sum of if every element can be uniquely expressed as this, as a sum. where small m i comes from capital M i. That means every element first of all here in one condition there are two conditions actually. Every element in the module should be expressible in this manner that is the first condition. It should be uh, able to be written as a sum of elements from these submodules. And the second condition is that any such expression should be unique. That means there is only one way of writing M like that, not two distinct ways. Okay. So that is the notion of a module being the direct sum of a number of submodules of it. Now, if you recall, when we defined the notion of a vector space being the direct sum of subspaces, we also proved a result, namely that uh, you remember internal direct sum, external direct sum. So here also, in that sense, you can call M as the internal direct sum of these submodules. Now, if one considers this set, I mean as a set, if one considers this set, this Cartesian product, and then defines addition and multiplication of elements of this by ring elements uh, component wise. Okay, you should be able to understand what I am saying here. You define addition of two elements in this set component wise. Also, you define the multiplication of an element from this Cartesian product by a ring element component wise. If you do that, then under those two operations, this becomes an R module. And just like vector spaces, you can call this an external direct sum of this submodules because the submodules themselves are after all modules in their own right. This and M can then be proved to be isomorphic to each other as modules just like vector spaces. Okay, So these things can be done so although we are not going to do it right now. And then we are going to look at the very important notion of cyclic modules. I know it's a little boring to uh, go on and on defining things and without proving anything, but uh, the proof thing that result is coming. I will mention the result and then end the video. Let 
एम बी एंड आर मॉड्यूल एम इज स्टेट टू बी साइक्लिक और इज स्टेट टू बी ए साइक्लिक आर मॉड्यूल इफ there exists an element some distinguished element m not in m that generates the entirety of m in this sense such that every element m in m can be written as m is equal to r m not for some ring element r so you can see that this notion is somewhat like that of a cyclic group okay it's just like that in a cyclic group a single group element generates the entire uh, group here also a single module element generates the entire module so that's where we are in fact going to stop but after that there is one more notion uh, namely of finitely generated modules so we have seen a module being the direct sum of some of its sub modules then we have seen the notion of cyclic modules and in the next video we will see the notion of finitely generated modules now the result i was talking about is it states this every finitely generated module over the over any euclidean ring is the direct sum of a finite number of cyclic submodules and this result has as a consequence the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups which states that every finite abelian group is a direct product of cyclic groups and in fact uh, it's a very special corollary of this general result uh, the result in fact not just uh, says about finite abelian groups but finitely generated abelian groups namely the abelian group itself may be infinite but it has finitely many elements generating it okay so we will see this further things in the next video so that's just it for tonight and see you on next what is the day today today is tuesday right so that means our next upload is this coming friday and on friday let's go back to calculus so until then this is me lucifer from a mathematical group have a nice day